Hello, everyone. If you can hear me, if you can just type in the uh, chat box. I know we got a, another minute or so before we begin, so I appreciate everyone jumping on this afternoon. We had a bigger crowd this morning, but uh, we should have a nice size group. I know uh, one o'clock just hit, but we'll give it another minute or so before we begin. Thank you, Brandon. I appreciate that. Looking forward to giving some good information, hopefully as well. Hope everyone had a great weekend. We had beautiful weather here in Chicagoland. Um, I love this weekend, and uh, we got to soak it up because uh, summer is fastly uh, going away. So let's, let's hold on to the last few uh, nice weekends we have. I see a few more people logging on. We'll give it a start. And I uh, just want to appreciate uh, everyone joining us this afternoon. I know it's Monday. I know you're probably busy at work, but your employer, your company is taking time out to help you with your financial planning, especially when it relates to college planning for today. So thank them because I know there's a lot of things going on, but they want to educate you and make sure you're in the best position possible when it comes to college funding and other financial topics that we'll discuss over the years to make sure you're constantly off get the up-to-date information to benefit you and your family. So today we're focusing on college planning. And college planning, some of us on the call might have, our webinar might have children that are two, three, four years of age. Some might be 12, 13, 14 years of age. So today we're not gonna give anyone specific advice, but we're gonna talk very high level. If any one of you wanna talk one-on-one -on -one to see if we can help you, maybe file for FAXFA, get some more information, or help you with your financial planning. I'm more than uh, able to do that after the presentation. But if you do have some questions, I highly recommend you put those questions in the comment box. I'll try to answer most of them during the presentation or at least after the presentation. But some might be so specific, it might be best to answer on a one-to-one -one case because everyone's financial situation plus their you know, children's situations a little bit different. With that being said, I'll share my screen and go over the presentation for today. Again, this is sponsored through SOFA, Society for Financial Awareness. We're here to help educate you, strictly non-for-profit, help to give you good advice. Your company wants us to give you good advice. That's why we're here today and we'll be with you for the next few months. Um, we're gonna talk for about 30, 40 minutes, not be too long. If there's more questions, we might talk longer, but ultimately our goal is to give you some information but give you some things that you can take action on hopefully today uh because yesterday is too late so we're going to focus on what we can do today and going forward so far just so you guys know um is nationwide non-for-profit um we love educating people i myself during my day job i'm a financial advisor um but i love helping people i love education i talk about taxes college planning a variety of topics to help put people in the best situation possible because we all know what Google is, but Google doesn't always give us the right information or what we need. And we wanna make sure that we curtail that information to the audience we're talking to. Today, again, we're talking about college planning, but there's a lot of different things that we can talk about in the future if you want us to. It's been around since 1993, just help educate the public. The first question for today, for college, how much do I want to pay? Okay, how much do you as a parent want to give to your children for college funding? Now, I'm assuming since you're on this webinar, you do want to pay something because if you didn't want to pay anything, you might not even signed up for this webinar. So I'm assuming we have a very uh, generous sacrifice in parents that are attending this or future parents, and they do want to give some money to their kids for college education. But how much do you want to pay? That's a personal decision. But how much will you need is the second question. And that question, we don't know for 100% certainty because if you have a two-year-old now, who knows in 16 or so years with inflation how much truly you'll need for college. But I do know this, if we start planning today, 
you're going to be in a whole lot better situation in 16 years from now versus if you just think about it when they turn 16, hey, I should probably plan for college funding. So we're going to hopefully give you some actionable steps today. But today we want to start because if we look at uh, the cost of colleges um, in 2030, again, this is a nationwide non-for-profit, but in Illinois, it might be a little bit higher. But for private colleges, we're looking at $33,000 basically for a private college and over $15,000 for a public university. And that could be even higher when you factor in inflation. But uh, time will tell. The one thing we want to do is not be blindsided by these costs. We want to be proactive so we can hopefully pay out of our own pocket. Or if we're a little wise and a little smart, we might be able to get the government and other grants available to help pay for college funding for our children. So where will this money come from? Our child might be a fantastic athlete, a genius, a great person. But will they for sure have a scholarship? right? Injuries can occur. Life can change. We cannot rely 100% on having a scholarship for college because we know that's not a guarantee. So I would like you to prepare. That's why you're here today in the webinar. We got to prepare for what if we don't get any kind of scholarship? How are we going to be able to afford? How is your child going to be able to afford college funding? Because what you don't want is to set them up with a lot of debt right out of school then they got to start making money just to pay that interest. Now, just to give you a more timely subject, based on current laws today with the Biden administration, they've kind of delayed paying back those college loans to January of 2022. They have said that's the last time they're going to push it back. So come February, you got to start paying that in the future. But you know, whatever age your child is, we can't count on the government giving us some freebies or, or wiping off college debt. We got to prepare for this now because, to be frank, there's a lot of stimulus the last couple of years. There's a lot of things the government has done, but ultimately, we're going to probably pay that back in taxes, and that could be a lot of expenses uh, for your child in college as time goes on. But if your child is really good at a sport or an activity, there's nothing wrong with help supporting that and putting them in the best place possible because maybe they will get a scholarship but you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket and bank on that scholarship. One thing that people can do or students can do is they can be employed um, during their go to college. So there's some programs that offer between you know, 15 to 20 hours a week, but more than likely they're not going to make a high paying job. Maybe you know it's a waiter, a waitress, maybe it's a side job here and there, but it's hard to kind of they're, they're, they're spread so thin in their college courses. Then if they're working, it's tough to have that focus. But to be truthful, some people have to work just to pay for college. But in a perfect world, we want to try to avoid that because you want your child to focus on their studies and do the very best thing possible, not be working full time. Now, one thing that I like to recommend for my clients, and I think it's wise for others as well, is to have your child maybe look at an internship in a field that they are interested in while they are in college. Now that internship might be paid, it might not be paid, but at the very least, it's gonna start building that relationship up with your um, employer that they're interning with. So maybe they'll see their work ethic, see the skill sets that they're developing in college and working at the firm, and maybe out of school, they already have a job built in, or at least they got experience so they can get another job in the future. So an internship, in my mind, is a little better than having you know, a side job that they're not looking to be a waiter or a waitress for the rest of their life. But every situation is a little bit different. Um, we just want to make sure that your children are positioned as best as possible. So where is this money going to come from? You know, It could come out of your pocket, right? The child could work for it, or maybe it's a federal Pell Grant. Those are usually only awarded to undergraduate students who haven't earned a bachelor or professional degree. It could come from the Federal Supplement Educational Opportunity Grant, and that's for undergraduates with the lowest expected family contributions, or EFC, and it gives priority to students who receive federal um, Pell Grants. The difference between the two is the U.S. Department of Education guarantees that each school will receive enough for the Pell Grants, but there is no guarantee that every eligible student will receive the Federal Supplemental Educational Opportunity Grant. And so that's based on a case-by-case -case basis. 
So grants are great, but we can't get it all 100% guaranteed. If we get a loan, it comes in a few different versions. One loan is the uh, federal um, Stafford loan, or I'm sorry, the subsidized loan, which is the federal government pays interest on those loans um, with while the student's in school during the grace period um, until the pay repayment begins. The other one's an unsubsidized loan. And the borrower is responsible for the interest accrued from the issue of the loan, although it's not required to pay it until after the grace period expires. Now, there's also this thing called the federal Perkins loans, which are low interest rate loans for undergraduate and graduate students um, with extraordinary financial need. But the college is the lender, even though primarily the funds are coming from the government, no loan fees are charged. And us parents have the option of doing a plus loan, which enables the parents or us with good credit um, histories to borrow and pay the educational expenses of the dependent child who is the undergraduate um, at that time. So again, as a, as a parent, you might made a lot of sacrifices and maybe you wanna make more, but you can put that on your credit and make it your responsibility. Your child could also get it through some different grants and some different loans. And ultimately they're gonna probably have to pay that back and they got interest on that, but there's a few ways that you can get the money from that. So there's a few things that you can do right now to prepare for college funding. We'll talk about some main ones and maybe some ones that you've never heard of before. There's the Coverdale Educational Savings Account, uh, which used to be the Educational IRA. There's the 529 College Savings Plan, which a lot of people I think are taking advantage of. And then there's called Index Universal Life Insurance, which you might be thinking, why is he mentioning life insurance in a college planning course? Well, I'm gonna go over that in a little bit more detail as time goes on. But those are the three main ones. Let's talk about the 529. When you put money into a 529, you get a deduction on your taxes. Now, it depends what state you're in. You know, For Illinois though, for the first $10,000, if you're a single taxpayer, you get to deduct that off your taxes or $20,000 if you're a married couple filing jointly. So that gives you a tax deduction. Not only does it give you the deduction, but when you put the money in, you invest it, and all that growth in that 529, if used for educational purposes, is gonna be tax-free. So it's a great way to kind of build that tax deferred, then take it out for educational purposes. Uh, excuse me. You can hold it in different investment accounts and trustees. Um, one thing the beneficiary also can change. So say you do have a, a genius uh, child and they get all these scholarships, that's great. Well, maybe you had a 529 in their name, but maybe they didn't need to use it. Well, you can kind of pivot and put that in another child's name and have them use it for educational purposes because they maybe didn't get those scholarships. So that can be changed as long as it's used for educational purposes. It can be established at different banks, financial institutions, um, and you have a variety of options that are available to you. Now, most people want to grow that, kind of get it more aggressive because they want to kind of keep up with inflation. Plus, if we look at uh, right now the interest rate environment we're in, if you're conservative on a 529, you're almost not making much, maybe 1%, 2%, and you're not even keeping up with inflation. Um, but the one thing I caution those that are on this call or when they get a 529, say they're they're starting a little bit late. Maybe they're starting at 15 or 16 years of age for their child. If they be super aggressive when they put the money in and markets at all time high, what if we have a correction right before you need to access those funds? Then technically you could have less than you even started with. So you don't want to be super aggressive in the 529 right before you need to take it but you don't wanna be super conservative because you're not keeping up with inflation. So that's where a lot of people have to kind of pick and choose and see, hey, what do we wanna be? Do we wanna take a risk? Do we not wanna take a risk? Uh, at the very least, you'll get a tax deduction, but you gotta to talk to your financial advisor kind of how you wanna position that. Now, some limitations to this. Um, nationwide, we can put up to $15,000 per individual per year without filing a gift to state return. Now. I just want to kind of go a little bit off track a little bit. Um, some people think I can't give more than $15,000. Well, for a husband and wife, technically give $30,000 for two people um, to a, a child or to a gift to somebody and not file a gift return. 
But even if you say you give $100,000 to a gift for some person, it's not the wor- it's not a taxable event. It's not the worst thing in the world. The IRS just requires you to file an extra form on your taxes so it's reportable. It goes against your estate tax exemption, which for a married couple is well over $10 million, which doesn't affect a whole lot of people. So it's not like you're going to get penalized if you give more than $15,000. Um, but I just want to make sure you're aware of that. Without filing that extra form, you can get $15,000 per individual or $30,000 per couple. Now, you can only have one account established for beneficiary in a 529. It could, though, actually hurt you when it comes to financial aid. Uh, for a lot of us on this webinar, maybe they haven't filed for FAXFA or they're just thinking about it. When you file for financial aid through FAXFA, they might look at your assets, look at your 529, and it could actually bump you out of getting grants or some scholarships because you might have too much money in there or your other accounts. So know that that could have a negative impact. On the withdrawals, like we mentioned before, have to be for educational purposes. We cannot have you saying, you know what, my son or daughter needs a new car. Let me take out that 529. Let me buy that nice new car. They needed to get to school. Technically, that's not an educational deduction. It has to be for college tuition, for books, things that are personally um, related to the education, not the car that gets them to the school and back. Um, so make note of that. Uh, they have to be made prior for contributions before 18 and generally have to be liquidated by the age of 30. So there is some limitations on there. And what if your children never go to college? Well, you could transfer that maybe to another family member, but that might defeat the purpose of what you were trying to accomplish. Now, when we look at uh, Coverdale accounts, they're not as, I think, lucrative as the 529s. The, the max contribution is $2,000 per individual. Just like the 529s, you get that tax deferred growth on um, all the growth if used for educational um, expenses. Yes, you can use different custodians or trustees to manage those accounts. And you can change the beneficiary if you'd like to. Um, but personally, most people like the 529. You get the tax deduction. You can put more into it. Um, it's a little bit easier to set up. You can go online and do that through Brightstar or some other uh, companies. Uh, I personally like the 529 over the Coverdale account. But just like the 529, there's limitations. You're limited in the investment options. Uh, it can be counted against you when it comes to financial aid when you're filing for FAXFA and withdrawals have to be used for those qualified educational accounts, not that new uh, Porsche or that new car that your child wants to get back and forth from uh, college. So make note of that. When we look at college planning as a family, there's a lot of things to factor in. One is your risk profile. Some people are more aggressive, some people are more conservative. When you're looking at the timing for college planning, you don't want to be so much at risk right before you need to take the money out. Because the last thing you want to do is have the market dip and then be forced to sell at a loss. And same thing for retirement when I talk to people. You don't have all your money in the market at the all-time high and then you quit your job and the next thing you know, the market falls apart and you have to sell at a loss. Make sure that you're not overly exposed at risk before you need it. Now, if your child is, you know, three, five, seven, they got some time before they might need that money. Plus, you're probably going to continue to put money in or maybe call it dollar cost averaging. You're throwing in that 529. Well, then you can be more aggressive because the market over time will go up and you'll buy when the market's low and kind of kind of recover even faster. So it depends on when you need to tap into that money on your time horizon. Um, but you also got to look at inflation risk. You know, if we're lucky enough to make any kind of interest on our checking or savings account, um, it's still not going to keep up with inflation because interest rates are so low today. And some people have a lot of money in their bonds or they kind of allocate for the target date in the 529s. But those bonds are short term treasuries. You're losing money to inflation just by keeping it so conservative. So you kind of got to balance act that out because not all your money should be aggressive, but you don't want to have it just sitting there for years, not making anything because you could actually be losing your purchasing power by keeping that money uh, too conservative. We got to look at taxes. 
Um, we don't want to take out that 529 not for educational um, events because then you're going to pay taxes on that growth and you're going to have a penalty if you do that. So taxes are a huge thing. I love the 529 though for getting that tax deduction. We live in Illinois. We pay enough taxes in Illinois. It's nice to save some money in taxes by doing the 529. But above anything else, we got to avoid procrastination. As humans, that's, a, that's who we are, right? We're like, why do it today when we can do it tomorrow? But when it comes to college funding, as some of you as parents know, time is, they used to be so little and they grow so fast. Time flies by. But if you invest a little bit now or today, that, that money is going to grow so much better when you give it compound time. So do not procrastinate when it comes to college funding. You don't want to start thinking about that when the child's 16, 17. You want to start when they're six or seven months old to make sure that you can plan accordingly. I'm a firm believer that if all of us look at our expenses or our budget, we can always carve out maybe a hundred bucks or so that we didn't really need to spend. Maybe it's that Starbucks, maybe it's going out to dinner, whatever that may be for you and your family. Try to carve out a little bit of money to put it toward college education or for your retirement accounts. Uh, you have a great employer plan right now. Take advantage of that. Put some away for college funding because you want to really let that compound time and interest expand. And that little hundred bucks here and there goes such a long way if you start early enough. So do not let procrastination affect you and your family. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about the tax code. Okay, I'm not going to read the fine print here because it's, it's too fine. I don't think I can even read it, but it's section 7702. And I want you to think differently about the next two words I say, life insurance. I'm sure many of you are thinking life insurance means it only benefits my beneficiaries when I pass away. And that is kind of like the old type of life insurance, but that's not the type of life insurance that I'm talking to you today about. I'm talking about life insurance that will benefit you while you're alive or also benefit your children for when it comes to college funding. And there's a few different ways it can benefit you. But before I go into all those details, let's talk a little bit how it works. Now, say you have your money in a traditional investment account, maybe a 529. Say you're 100% in the market in the S&P 500. Over the last 20 years, this is kind of what it would look like. If you look at that, in 01 and 02, you had some negative years, but then it recovered. And then in 08, it went down. And the last 10 years or so, it's been fantastic. But if you had all your money at risk and your child needed it for college and they were in 2008, they had a lot less to put toward college and they were forced to sell when the market was down. But if you needed it in 2020 and you were up big, you kind of took a profit and you got to use a good portion for college funding tax free. The problem is, I don't know what the market's going to do, nor do you know what the market's going to do tomorrow, next year, or next 10 years. But over time, it usually does perform. And if you look at this over 20 years, we've actually averaged annually 6.61%. Now, some of you are like, oh, that's low. Well, I think we're kind of jaded the last 10 years how good the market's been. But if you look at the last 20 years, it's actually just over 6.6% the S&P 500 is performing at. But when it comes to a 529, you want to be careful because you don't want all that money at risk. So this special design index universal life insurance, it works a lot different than your traditional market accounts. The difference is when the market drops, like in 01 and 02, you don't make anything. But most importantly, you don't lose a dime. You get a big fat zero when the market's down. Now, the trade-off is when the market goes up, as you see, it goes up 28% uh, in 2003. Well, you're not going to make 28% in this investment. You're going to make the max is, say, 11%. So they cap you on the growth, but you have none of the downside risk. Um, but look at 2008. Market was down 37%. You didn't lose a dime in this type of structure. So what that allowed you to do, say you needed it for college funding, you could take money out of this investment and not sell at a loss. You just got a zero for that year. So you don't have to sell when the market's super far down. But the next year when the market goes up, you continue to add to your gains. So if you look at that over 20 years, it's not as high as the market, but you got 6.31% and you weren't ever forced to sell when the market is down. 
So for college funding and timing, you might want to consider using this so you're not having a big market correction right before you need to take out the money. Uh, the beautiful thing about this is it doesn't have to be used only for educational expenses. You can use it for college education. Technically, you can use it to pay for a new car, or you can even use it for your own retirement accounts if your kids get scholarships and they don't need to go to college or they, they got paid for going to college. So you don't need to use it just for educational funding. It gives you some flexibility, but it gives you competitive growth with no market risk, which is really nice. So when it comes to tax risk, you know, taxes are probably going to go higher. In my opinion, we want to deduct as much taxes as possible. And maybe the 529 is a great way to do that. But when you use this special design um, index universal life insurance, you take out that income 100% tax free, which is uh, pretty fantastic, whether it be for college funding or for your own personal retirement. We talked about the saver's dilemma. Some people don't want to jump in the market when it's at an all time high but they don't want to put it in their CDs or I call certificates of disappointment or their savings because they're not paying anything. This is kind of in between. You get the competitive growth of the market, but none of the downside risk. That's the power of indexing. But just like all life insurance, you still have a built-in death benefit. So say, God forbid, you're the breadwinner and God forbid you pass away in a car crash. Well, your family now is a tax-free death benefit that'll help not only pay for college, but keep the family stable over the next few years. That's maybe not the reason why you're buying this policy, because I like to use it for college funding or for retirement income, but it's a great option that you have. On top of everything else I just mentioned, when you're applying for FAXFA and for college funding, um, they look at your 529, they look at your Coverdale accounts, they look at your total assets that are liquid, not in your uh, 401ks, but your other uh, tangible assets. And they see, hey, if they have a few hundred thousand dollars or they have a 529, maybe they don't get different grants or scholarships. So say hypothetically, you're six, your child's 16 years of age, they're about to go into college. Maybe we didn't do good planning many years ago we could potentially move that money that you currently have and move it into an index universal life insurance. And legally, it kind of becomes invisible from that FAXFA form, even though that money is working hard for you. So you could technically get more grants, more scholarship money, and not pay out of your own pocket, but let that money still grow and then take it out tax-free in the future. You don't know what you don't know. And I'm sure many of us, you know, in the first filing for our college, for our children, we don't do this all the time. This is not our profession. And to be frank, I am not a professional college planner. I like to educate on it, but I actually have another team I work with. If people want help filing out all the forms and getting everything ready for the colleges, I can kind of refer you to them and they can do that for you. They, they do charge for that time and service, but usually, 80% plus the time you will save that money you pay them and hopefully a lot more because you can't specialize in everything and you would hate to have you and your child miss thousands of dollars on the table because you didn't know what you didn't know. So again, this is educational, not trying to sell anything, but if you need help with that, you can contact me. I can try to get you in touch. I just want to make sure that you're not stressed when it comes to filing for FAXFO and you save as much money as possible. So. A lot of options you have uh, at your disposal, but again, just again, talking about procrastination, time is of the essence. On this simple chart, if you invested just $2,000 a year for five years, when your child was zero to five years of age, your total investment would be $10,000. Say it grew at 12%. In exactly you know 18 years, you'd have $62,000 that you could use for college funding. But what if you didn't have the money or what if you just procrastinated and you started adding $2,000 a year, um, age six through 18 years of age, you would have contributed over double what you initially would have in the previous scenario. You would have put in $26,000. If it still grew at 12%, you would still have $62,000. That's why a little bit over time goes a lot longer than even more money in a shorter time frame. 
please do not start. Um, do not delay. Please start today. I'm telling you, time is of the essence when it comes to college planning. You don't want to wait till it's too late. So which financial savings vehicle should you choose? The truth is, I don't know. Everyone is a unique situation. I am more of a fan of the 529s for the tax deduction, with being maybe more aggressive, and then having the index universal life insurance still making competitive returns, but it doesn't have that market risk. So if the market's down a year for college funding, maybe you take it out of that index universal life insurance. But what if the market's up 30% that year and you have a 529 that's aggressive? Maybe then you take for that year out of the 529 to lock in those profits. Using that strategy will allow you never to sell when the market's down, but to continually keep that competitive growth over time. How much are you going to plan for? Again, I don't know. Your child hopefully will get more grants and scholarships, um, but we don't know how much it's going to cost them. But I do know if you start planning today, you're going to be in a much better position for the future. How do you figure out specifically how much you need for your dependents? None of us know, but we want to make sure that we plan accordingly. And a little bit of planning goes a very long way, but you need to get started today. Right now, look at your expenses, look at your budget, see how much can you carve away to put towards your college savings, to put toward 529, to put to maybe an index universal life insurance. One thing I'll also mention about the life insurance is you have to be relatively you know, healthy. If you just had cancer, God forbid, or have a major medical event, you may not be able to get it in your own life, but maybe you can look at getting it for your spouse and using their life to grow that money tax deferred and then take that income out tax free. I had a question from the previous uh, presentation this morning and they said, what are the fees in the IUL? Okay, index universal life insurance. Well, first let me talk about a 529. 529s have internal fee funds, but relatively they're pretty low when it comes to a 529. Um, but they do have some fees built into that because anywhere you put your money, somebody is making money on your money. If you put money in a bank, they give you a little bit of interest and then they loan out that money for loans or for home mortgages. That's how they make a living. So when it comes to index universal life insurance, they do not have an exact fee per se, but they do have this thing called cost of insurance. So for that money you put into the policy, say you put in $5,000, you have a death benefit of say $250,000. So you are paying for that death benefit with that cost of insurance. And, but God forbid you passed away, that full $250,000 would go tax-free to your beneficiaries. So if you look at life insurance over say 15 to 20 years, in most policies you're paying about a half a percent of total cost of insurance. Um, so that kind of equates to you know paying a fee in a, in a normal brokerage account, but life insurance does have more fees in the first few years, but over the 15 to 20 years, about a half a percent is what you'll ultimately pay in cost of insurance fees, but you get the tax-free uh, income, you get the death benefit, um, and it's, you get the protection against the market losses. So it kind of balances each other out. So that's one thing I want to discuss. Is there any questions? I know we have a smaller group today, but any questions that anyone have about the presentation, about anything in general that we can answer at this uh, presentation? One thing that I am going to do is I'll just put an offer here if you want to um, reach out to me and schedule something personally. You're more than welcome to no obligation i love helping people i love educating hopefully we can educate you and your families and even if it's a two minute call i'm happy to take that call so i'll wait a minute or so to see if there's any questions that i can address doesn't look like the questions are coming in I got a question, why doesn't everyone do an index universal life insurance? Um, well, the reason is, you know, people don't know what they don't know. And I think people are just not educated on these because it's not mainstream. But I know for people trying to protect assets for FAXFA and trying to get them into grow competitively, these are a fantastic vehicle 
uh, for many people, but it's not a fit for everyone. So you got to look at your own personal situation. Well, my friends, my 30 or so minutes is up. I think uh, someone said, hey, the super helpful for being a new parent. First of all, congratulations. That's amazing. We want to start today, but 18 years is going to fly by very fast. So uh, I hope you guys have a fantastic rest of the day. I look forward to answering your financial questions over the next few months and have a great uh, rest of the week. Happy Monday, everyone. Take care now.